on World News Tonight. Nuclear threats. Russia says it has successfully test launched a nuclear capable intercontinental ballistic missile. The damage seems to be more powerful than the one that struck Japan. Head to head. The presidential candidates locked horns in a fiery debate as France prepares to head for polls for Sunday's election. Deadly spread. The number of cases outside quarantine areas across Shanghai rose again. Tonight, the latest on how the nation copes up. And it's carnival time. Streets in Rio de Janeiro were filled with music, cheer and colour as they welcomed the carnival of the Covid hiatus. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, as Russia carries out a full-fledged offensive in eastern Ukraine, U.S. State of Secretary Antony Blinken warned that atrocities in Mariupol could actually be far worse than those seen in Bucha following Russia's withdrawal. He also underscored that the need to continue U.S. support for Kyiv. America's top diplomat has warned that he believes atrocities in Ukraine's poor city of Mariupol will turn out to be, quote, far worse than in Pucha, where scores of civilians were found to have been tortured and killed following the withdrawal of Russian troops. What the world witnessed just a couple of weeks ago when the receding Russian tide from Bucha revealed what was left in its wake in terms of death, destruction, atrocities. We can only anticipate that one, this tide also at some point recedes from Mariupol. We're going to see far worse, if that's possible to imagine. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also stressed that Washington is assisting by providing evaluation and assessments of the situation to the Ukrainian government. As fighting continues, the UN chief has requested a separate meeting with the presidents of Ukraine and Russia. The secretary general said at this time of great peril and consequence, he would like to discuss urgent steps to bring about peace in Ukraine and the future of multilateralism based on the charter of the UN and international law. Against his backdrop, the Kremlin says it's waiting for an answer from Ukraine after it submitted a draft document on negotiations. This comes amid increasing skepticism over whether Moscow is negotiating in good faith after the U.S. and U.K. insisted that Russian forces were repositioning instead of scaling back from Ukraine. In related news, the U.S. has imposed fresh sanctions on dozens of Russian individuals and entities. The new round of sanctions announced Wednesday targets a Russian commercial bank and a virtual currency mining company. Washington has also decided to impose visa restrictions on 635 Russian nationals who have been involved in activities that threaten the territorial integrity of Ukraine and have been involved in human rights abuses in the Donbas region of Ukraine. Russia says it has successfully tested a new ICBM that's reportedly capable of delivering warheads 2,000 times more powerful than the atomic bombs that dropped in Japan in 1945. U.S. officials say that they were aware of Russia's plans and insist that it isn't too much of a concern. Is nuclear war possible? This is a question nations may well be asking themselves after Russia on Wednesday claimed to have successfully tested its new Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile. This missile is known to be capable of delivering nuclear warheads, 2,000 times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Following the launch, Russian President Vladimir Putin said the new and long-awaited addition to its arsenal would make Moscow's enemies stop and think. This truly unique weapon will strengthen the combat potential of our armed forces and reliably ensure Russia's security from external threats. Pundits say the test comes at a symbolic time, less than three weeks before Russia's annual Victory Day celebrations, which are marked by a parade where Moscow shows off its latest weapons. But it also comes at the peak of geopolitical tension due to Russia's war in Ukraine. However, Wednesday's test launch wasn't that big of a surprise to those in the West, particularly the U.S., who are aware of any ICBM test launches by Russia under the terms of the Strategic Arms Reduction Agreement. 
The Defense Department said today that we did not deem the test a threat to the United States or its allies, and the timing and the scope of Russia's missile test do not influence our approach to countering Russia's further invasion of Ukraine. Both the United States and Russia signed an updated agreement in 2010 to prevent unexpected military clashes during their missile tests. It was billed as a match between two French presidential candidates, one who inspired fear and the other loathing. In the much-anticipated debate, Marine Le Pen set out to show the French should not be afraid to give her a chance to run the country, while Emmanuel Macron was determined to fix his image of the man that the French love to hate. French President Emmanuel Macron and far-right challenger Marine Le Pen locked horns on Wednesday in a high-stakes election debate. They're only one before Sunday's presidential election. The angry face-off saw them spar over the war in Ukraine, specifically Le Pen's links to Russia, as well as the economy, the idea of a hijab ban and the European Union. Macron's strongest line of attack against his rival was her past admiration of Russian President Vladimir Putin and a loan for her 2017 campaign contracted through a Russian bank. You depend on the Russian power. You depend on Mr. Putin. A few months after saying that, Madame Le Pen, you took out a loan from a Russian bank in 2015. First Czech Russian bank. Le Pen rejected the accusations. He knows very well that I am a completely free and independent woman. For Le Pen, who lags Macron in voter surveys by as much as 56 to 44, the debate was a chance to persuade voters she has the stature to be president. Le Pen has toned down her once staunchly anti-EU rhetoric as part of a bid to broaden her electoral appeal. She pledged to give money back to millions of French made poorer during Macron's five-year presidency. But she continued her far-right anti-hijab stance. I want to ban the hijab in the public space. I think, and I'll say it in the clearest possible way, that the veil is a uniform imposed by Islamists. Voters will be reckoning with two opposing visions of France. Macron offers a pro-European, liberal platform, while Le Pen's nationalist manifesto is founded on deep Euroscepticism. A snap poll conducted for the BFM TV channel showed that 59% of respondents found Macron the more convincing of the two. However, Macron's lead in opinion polls is much narrower than five years ago, when he beat Le Pen with 66.1% of the vote. China has said that the black box flight recorders of a plane that crashed last month were badly damaged and have yet to provide any clues to explain the aircraft's sudden plunge into a, woods, a wooden hillside, killing at least 132 passengers and the crew. China says the black boxes from a Boeing jet that crashed there last month are severely damaged. That means it will take time to recover and analyse the data they hold. The 737-800, operated by China Eastern Airlines, went down in the mountains of Guangxi on March 21st. All 132 people on board died. The black boxes were subsequently recovered and sent to the US for analysis. In a statement on its preliminary report, the Civil Aviation Administration of China did not make public any information recovered from the flight recorders. It said the crew were fully qualified, the jet was well maintained, the weather was fine and there were no dangerous goods on board. That leaves the cause of the crash as a mystery and one aviation expert says it could take a year to glean clues from the black boxes. China Eastern has begun flying 737-800s again following the crash. It's a different model from the 737 MAX, which remains grounded in China following two deadly crashes in other countries. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, as Shanghai continues to grapple with COVID, tough restrictions would remain in place for now, even in districts which managed to cut COVID-19 transmissions to zero, as the number of cases outside quarantine areas across the city rose again. Supermarket manager Zhang Wei wakes at 5 a.m. after a night in a sleeping bag on her office floor in Shanghai. 
to prepare the 3,000 plus orders of vegetables, meat and essentials the staff send out every day to locked-in residents. Isolated from the outside world since April 1st, Zhang and more than 40 staff have been working long days to fill online orders from neighbouring housing compounds. Officials then deliver the goods. Basically, there is no time to rest. We are busy all day, even during meals if the neighbourhood committee members turn up to pick up orders or have a request. We will assist them immediately or solve whatever problems they may have. More than 1,000 grocery stores have stayed open during Shanghai's lockdown, but under a stringent closed-loop system. Workers must live on-site, test for the virus daily and disinfect the site and products every few hours. Shanghai's caseload remains modest by global standards, with about 16,000 asymptomatic coronavirus cases and 2,500 symptomatic cases on Tuesday. But the city has become a testing ground for China's COVID elimination strategy. Zhang is determined to keep going, despite the long days. First of all, I will definitely stay until the end, no matter when the epidemic ends. I will stay in the supermarket to lead our staff. If I am allowed to go out, the first thing I want to do is to go back home to see my parents. Each staff member has their own sleeping nook, with some sleeping in tents for privacy. Carrefour has provided them with protective gear, such as hazmat suits, and doubled their wages. Two rapidly spreading wildfires are burning over 25,000 acres in Arizona, forcing thousands to evacuate. The flames have been destroyed dozens of structures and both fires are 0% contained. Tonight, dual wildfires burning out of control in Arizona, consuming over 25,000 acres, leaving a path of destruction. Gusting winds and dry conditions driving the tunnel fire across more than 16,000 acres and scorching nearly 25 structures. The blaze, 0% contained, forcing the evacuation of more than 2,000 near Flagstaff. Bill Wells escaped as the flames closed in, but returned to utter destruction. All the houses that I had seen that were there earlier, 45 minutes earlier, uh, except for one, were all burned to the ground. That's Cindy Wilson also got away, but now holds out hope her home has not faced the same fate. I cried driving away because you just don't know. You don't know if you're going to come home to anything. In nearby Yavapai County, the Crooks Fire destroying approximately 9,000 acres and, like the Tunnel Fire, still 0% contained. Nearby communities are now under evacuation orders. The Grand Slams organizers said tennis players from Russia and Belarus will not be allowed to compete at this year's Wimbledon due to Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Wimbledon confirmed Wednesday it will not welcome tennis players from Russia or Belarus this year, banning the athletes over Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. That means men's world number two, Daniil Medvedev, the Russian and reigning champion of the U.S. Open, will not be able to compete on the famous grass courts. The Grand Slam's organizers, All England Lawn Tennis Club, said in a Wednesday statement, quote, in the circumstances of such unjustified and unprecedented military aggression, it would be unacceptable for the Russian regime to derive any benefits from the involvement of Russian or Belarusian players with the championships. Along with Medvedev, Andrei Rublev, ranked eighth in the world, will miss out. Women's world number four, Arena Sabalenka, and two-times Grand Slam champion Victoria Azarenka of Belarus will also be affected. It's a change of course for Wimbledon. The illustrious event has not banned athletes from specific countries since after World War II, when players from Germany and Japan were not allowed to compete. The Kremlin blasted the move, calling the ban unacceptable. Workers at an Apple store in Atlanta filed a petition to hold a union election seeking to become the company's first U.S. store to unionize amid a wave of labor activity at the other major firms. An Apple store in Atlanta could be the company's first in the U.S. to unionize. Workers there on Wednesday filed a petition to hold a union election, riding the momentum of efforts at other major corporations like Starbucks and Amazon. I mean, there is no doubt that what we are seeing right now is an historic moment. Wilma Liebman was chairman of the National Labor Relations Board under the Obama administration. I think they have an inside movement called Apple II 
T-O-O. Um, so I, I, I think filing actually for an election is to some extent the a logical next step. Apple's workers at Cumberland Mall are hoping to join the Communication Workers of America. That union, which backs the workers' effort, said that of the more than 100 workers eligible to join in sales, technical, creative, and operations roles, over 70 percent signed cards expressing their desire to organize. Corporations should wake up and see that, that the workers should have a voice if they want a voice, and they should be at the very least neutral to these union organizing efforts. A spokesperson for the National Labor Relations Board confirmed the agency's Atlanta office received the union petition on Wednesday. If certain conditions are met, the NLRB will work with the union and the employer to arrange an election. Apple did not immediately respond to requests for comment. The company is known for its reticent culture, but last year workers began criticizing the company's working conditions online. One Atlanta worker involved in the unionization efforts said in a statement, quote, we want to make sure that every Apple worker is able to afford quality housing and basic living expenses. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Indian Navy has launched its sixth and final domestically built Scorpion submarine, named after a sun dish, the Vakshil, was launched at the Magazine Dock shipyard in Mumbai following rituals and prayers. Rapper ASAP Rocky was taken into custody in connection to a November 2021 shooting as he arrived from Barbados to Los Angeles International Airport. The U.S. Justice Department appealed a judge's ruling ending a mask mandate on public transportation and airplanes after the CDC said that the measure was still needed. Elon Musk tweeted a series of dashes for a missing word following by is the night, days after he offered to buy Twitter for $43 billion. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson arrived in India for a two-day visit. On Friday, Johnson will visit New Delhi for talks with Modi, including on a new defensive partnership and a free trade agreement, which the two countries began discussing in January. Actor Johnny Depp continues testimony on his life and marriage with Amber Heard, including events that marked the end of their relationship. The actor concluded his narrative on their marriage by testifying that accusations of the domestic violence brought by former wife Amber Heard had destroyed his career. Um, and then I looked down and realized that the, the, the tip of my finger had been Severed. On his second day of testimony in his defamation trial against Amber Heard, actor Johnny Depp said his ex-wife was the one who became violent when their relationship soured, claiming that she threw a vodka bottle at him that severed the tip of his right middle finger. Asked to describe the violence, Depp said Heard would strike out with a slap or shove and recalled times she threw a TV remote at his head or a glass of wine in his face. Among the images his team submitted as evidence was a photo of the injury to his finger, which was surgically repaired. Also, one of Depp in an emergency room. Depp said he would remove himself from the situation, sometimes locking himself in a bedroom or bathroom, and never struck Heard. But you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. Oh, yeah. Several audio recordings of arguments between the couple were played in court, with Heard acknowledging starting physical fights and striking Depp in one of them. Depp has accused Heard, also an actor, of defaming him when she penned a December 2018 opinion piece in the Washington Post about being a survivor of domestic abuse. Attorneys for Heard have argued that she told the truth and that her opinion was protected as free speech under the First Amendment. In opening arguments, Heard's attorneys said Depp physically and sexually assaulted her while abusing drugs and alcohol. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of Brazilian samba schools, dancers, musicians and floats parading through the world-famous stadium as spectators cheered on to welcome the carnival in Rio de Janeiro. Thank you again for watching us. Have a good night.